Is it not the case that the greatest novels that we read are not necessarily the ones that we agree with? They are the ones that we enter into a kind of empathetic conflict with, that we see our own faults, we see the ugliness of life, we see beauty in things that the main characters cannot. We really enter into this sort of emotional and psychological struggle. And that certainly was the case for me with the posthumous memoirs of Bras Cubas that today, by Machado de Assis of Brazil, that today, I, fresh off of reading it, I will say is the most extraordinary literary experience that I can remember. And I should say, welcome to Mike Reads the World. Thank you for watching. And uh, after this uh, final novel for Brazil, for this project, we will be moving on to other countries, but this is one that I have just really been eager to read. And it was in no way a letdown. It was really when I finished reading it, I actually wrote a letter to the fictional and deceased character of Bras Cubas, which I will read at the end of this video uh, for those who would be uh, bored and don't want one spoiler that I actually give in the letter. So stay tuned for that if you don't mind one spoiler. Uh, there's plenty more to find. I don't think it will ruin your experience of this book at all if you even notice it or remember it. So with that, I want to say that the, first of all, the life of Machado de Assis, while the, the um, notes in this book, like the introductory notes, or, or maybe it was at the end, say that Machado de Assis gave very little importance to his own life uh, and, and believed that his work, his literary work, was the most important thing, that um, he didn't want, he didn't consider his own life, even though he came from a humble background. Um, his uh, grandparents were, in fact, uh, freed slaves, and he lived during a time in Brazil most of his life where slavery was still legal. Brazil was the, the final um, Western country to, you know, eliminate that. So this is... Um, the context of Machado de Assis's life is quite interesting, but it's the work itself that that really matters, and even he believed that. And it's it's quite interesting, though, to think that why would uh, somebody in this position choose to write a novel from the position of a um, privileged elite in Brazil? In fact, Bras Cubas's family um, and people around him are uh, slave owners and um, overall people that uh, you don't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily think that somebody who grew up in humble backgrounds, worked their way up and uh, would have that those sorts of experiences would tell a story in this way. Um, and yet there is, you know, you start the book wondering, well, is, is this whole book kind of making fun of Bras Cubas? Because Bras Cubas is a man that, that right at the beginning of the book tells us he is dead. And the circumstances of his death, um, he makes it very clear, have left a life in which he's basically a zero at, at the zero sum of things. He hasn't left behind any legacy. His life is kind of failure after failure. Um, and nothing extraordinary really happens in his life, even though he, you know, was born with a silver spoon, he could have done just about anything, and the results of his actual life are quite, you might say, underwhelming. This is kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 me a book about a mediocre man, really. And, but we really can all see ourselves in him, and if, uh, if, if you really come more from the female side of things, his, uh, I guess his lifelong love interest is you'll meet uh, Virgilia. Um, 
she is a very flawed character and a very complex character as well. So you kind of get both the male and, and, and female side of that in the life of Bras Kubas. So I can't encourage somebody to read this book enough. It's a book that I think almost everyone should read. I feel I'm understating how incredible it is. Um, yeah, it's like every book I like, I end up saying is my favorite book, but I think I really mean it with this one. It's it's really my favorite book right now. No, there's no book that is ever, as soon as I was done reading it, I picked up a pen and paper and wrote a letter about it. Um, so as as I've kind of implied, Bras Kubas is a is a very imperfect man. He and writing this story to us from beyond the grave. Some have said that this makes it kind of the first modernist novel. Not only because of that, but because the chapters, of which are varying length, some are very short, some are a little bit longer, and tend to be kind of out of order sometimes or stream of consciousness or you will have kind of experimental chapters, but nothing experimental in the way that comes off as pretentious. And that's one of the things I love most about this book is that anything that could could be sort of a pretentious experiment has the effect generally of making me laugh. There are a lot of, this book is like very humorous and I would say even darkly humorous uh, at times, but also at other times, lightly humorous. There, just Machado de Assis strikes me as an author that um, more than any author I can say this about at this point, Machado de Assis, if I had to pick one author to just, you know, bring him back to life and then go have a chat with him, have dinner with him, it would be Machado de Assis, undoubtedly. There was something in this book, the humor, I just got the humor, and it's, this is 1880 that this was written, and this translation, I have to give props to the translators. I assume they're being faithful because I haven't read it in the original Portuguese. Um, but Margaret Jewel Costa, uh, Costa and Robin Patterson did a fantastic job of making this an easy to read. I mean, I'm talking, I just, I flew through this one uh, in a couple days, a, a few days, and I couldn't stop reading it. It, it was just a you know, and I, I felt like I was getting to know this character of Bras Cubas to the point where I forgot about the author. So Machado de Assis kind of um, disappeared for me, but I always like, I was always very, the personality of this book is so strong that I can't help but feel like Machado de Assis was in many ways taking an ironic look at his own life and perhaps other people he knew in his life. The other characters in the book as well are are very flawed and and Bras Cubas is very uh, sometimes quite arrogant about describing the flaws as other, but is just as self-deprecating in other moments and will openly tell his readers that he feels no remorse for certain bad things he's done or, or go on a philosophical exploration, a short one, and a humorous one usually, about something that he has thought or done or something that another character said. Um, it's just an incredibly relatable book. It's, you know, even reading today. And this translation, I mean, I could go look up other translations, but I feel like this one, it would be hard to do better than this one, is my feeling. So... Yeah, what a book. What a book. This is easily a top five book for me right now. That top five is getting pretty crowded. It's probably like, a, you know, who knows what. I hate, once you're at that level, all I know is it's in that level. But once a book is at that level for me, I don't really feel a need to give it a, value, a further value judgment. I don't need to rank a top uh, 10, although it might be fun to try to do that someday at the end of this whole Reading the World project. But yeah, back to the book. Wow, it's just, uh, it's so outstanding. Um, and like when, so some of, in fact, my favorite moments are even right towards the beginning of the book. Uh, the, you know, he has, Bras Kubas, the character of Bras Kubas has 
a few love interests over his life, and all of them are kind of a, there's a different sort of thing going on, but one of the very first, this, this girl he goes crazy over as a young teen and is buying her all these gifts, well, it almost comes to something, but then it doesn't because his father sends him away to university in Europe. And this whole, some parts of his life, what's, what's amazing about this book is that it really captures this aspect of looking back on your life where whole massive sections that maybe you had a lot of fun and you experienced a lot of things get reduced to one paragraph of book, of memory. And that's what his experience at university in Europe is like. Like you would think that that whole ex journey in Europe would be chapters and chapters of, of exciting adventures, but that's not what this memoir is about. Uh, it reminds me of, I um, <laughs> just a really random reference. There's a song lyric. Uh, it's by one of John Frusciante's solo works. Uh, the only the only important moments are the in-between times. That is a, a lyric that has always just stayed in my head. And I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I uh, feel that no other book captures that sentiment better than this one. And it's almost a mantra in my life that the, the, the only important moments are the in-between times which is another way of saying now. The, the boring now, when you're not doing anything, is the most important uh, time. So it's, I guess it's sort of a, a, a mantra for being in the present in that way. Um, and a good reminder, a good reminder for myself, always. So, so this, this university experience is reduced to just like one chap small chapter. And I can relate to that because university was a really like, you know, a time of a lot of growth for me and, and a, a time I think about really fondly, but how much can I actually remember? Maybe bits and pieces and looking maybe at 60 years old or 50 years old like Bras Cubas or beyond the grave if such a life exists. Uh, I will only remember it as a small paragraph, you know, and on his journey to university, one of my favorite characters in the entire book is the sailor that Bras Cubas meets, who's also, um, also a poet. He's a sailor and a poet, and he tells Bras Cubas, you know, you know, it, something to the effect of, you have a whole life ahead of you, great things, you will accomplish great things, and it's, if I were to read this book again, you know, I already know that there would be this sort of like melancholy, bittersweet sadness to that statement, but also the joy of, of that moment. But also looking at the sailor who writes poems like for his wife and things like it, it's also really touching. And it's also like, well, you don't have to do great things either. It, maybe it's more honorable to be like this sailor poet man or who just has his his day job as the sailor, but but feels poetry, but writes poetry. And and there's other characters in this book where uh, even Bras Cubas, he sees their life as just this, um, this sort of, you know, you come into it and you go out without any fanfare and without any, any seemingly real purpose to it. Um, and and yet there's you as the reader can can find your own value judgment in that. Bras Cubas also has a great friend um, as later as the novel goes on, who we see his ups and downs throughout life. And another man from the privileged high society, right, where he goes to he has his fortune, loses it all, goes to rock bottom and then gets a big inheritance from someone who dies and he's right back on top. You know, it's like. Well, he didn't do anything to deserve any of that, but then he becomes this great philosopher, right? And he's and and creates this thing called what was it? Not humanism. It's human. Uh, I I can't remember what it's, it's. It's similar to human. The word is similar to humanism. Um. This is why YouTube isn't as good as having a friend because a friend could be like, no, I don't know. I know what you're talking about, but I got to get it right. You know, humanitism, uh, his friend, uh, 
Kinsas Borba, uh, creates this philosophy of humanitism that toward the end of the book uh, really starts to influence Bras Cubas, and his friend is like has these delusions of grandeur about it, and and he's, but even that kind of hits a dead end, and Bras Cubas too is just uh, it's kind of a life full of dead end after dead end of things that there are experiences that he transmits in this book that don't seem to come to anything, and yet you can relate as a reader to all of them. There's many times in this book that I disagree with Bras Cubas, but in a, sometimes in a lighthearted or a heavy, a heavy-hearted way. There's times when I disagree with his friend, or or want to have want to tell Bras Cubas like, well, that's kind of interesting, but do you really you really want to follow this friend? And it's like, the, the just the all the characters in this book seemed like real people to me and really came alive, and also the the economy of the book like. The fact that there's so much in here, in 239 pages, there are literary references, but none of them are like crucial to understanding the story. Um, and again, some people have called this, for being in 1880, the first modernist work, and yet modernist works I tend to associate with big, overbloated uh, stories describing kind of every little thing. Um, but Bras Cubas, Machado de Assis in this book has this sort of self-awareness where um, even as Bras Cubas he's telling you, you know, this chapter is pointless. <laughs> like, he'll say something that you think, oh, that's really profound or like, or that's, wow, that's really sad. And he's like, all right, there I go again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being all heavy. It's just, he's like, that's not the, he talks to you as the reader. And it's the most effective use of second person I have ever read. It's not the whole book. He'll say, you reader, you know, a few times, but this is truly, yeah, this is truly the greatest use of second person I think probably exists. Of course, I'm not as widely read as some people, but that is currently where I stand with this book. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I talked about, I talked about the sailor poet. Oh, there's so many, there's just so many quotable things in this book. Um, and I don't really want to give away uh, a lot of them. I just, I just implore you to read this book. I would recommend this before just about any book I've read in this project so far, and even before some of like, I mean, if if any of you have watched my other videos or look at the sort of books that I gravitate toward, they tend to be like these darker novels about exploring the subconscious or the darker aspects of humanity and psychology and mythology um, the, the unknown, things like that. And it's, uh, it's so refreshing to, to find a book like this that with, with like a sense of humor about it all, but also the same, instead of, instead of like this, this gravitas of plunging the depths of the abyss, it's this sort of, it's this sort of, uh, sitting around a campfire in the abyss, you know? And, uh, in in talking with some other people who are are, are just as uh, confused about it as you are, and and just sharing some stories that may or not me mean anything, but but that laughter, that humor, that irony, a little bit of lightheartedness, a little bit of fun infused into this book is what brings that personality of Machado de Assis alive. Is what makes me uh, feel like this joy about presenting this book to somebody else to read. I can recommend this book without a saying of like, oh, it's really dark, you know, like you got to be in the mood for it or, or saying like this book will change your life. It may not change your life. I feel like this book probably changed my life, <laughs> but I mean, it, it doesn't have to. It's just such a wonderful experience. It's, it's a, just in every sense of the word, a joyful and relatable read this is what you know this th this this is the greatest ex reading experience of my life that's all i can say about it i i mean i can't uh, i can't say it any other way um that's how i feel right now so with that i'm going to read you the letter that i wrote to Ross Kubas at the end of reading the book. So again, there is a minor spoiler, well, minor, major spoiler, kind of depends how you look at it in here, but I called it 
dated today's date october 28th 2023 a preemptive letter to bras kubas we've written our pieces on opposing hemispheres and opposing sides of the grave that is presuming there is more than one side of the grave your memoir's existence would imply that there is i've always taken things a little too seriously important things and small matters not seriously enough. That's why I have no sense of humor. When I finished reading your memoirs today, I felt an overwhelming compulsion to write back. I need to talk to you, and I have so many questions, or maybe just things I need to get off my chest, or maybe I'm haunted by your post-life existence brought on only, well, what I, by what I interpret as the requirement to equalize with an otherwise zero-sum life, a memoir to pass on your legacy in place of the child you couldn't have, the legacy of misery. <laughs> that was impolite. I, I'm, an, insen I'm insensi an insensitive person when I get carried away with an idea. I, I admire your use of the reader's time and patience, Brass, you knew what to include and what to leave out, how to make us laugh and feel the weight of things left unsaid. And I didn't write this, but I wanted to say, even though you were a terrible person sometimes. <laughs> I'll follow your example and close this letter, sending it to the stars, guided by the strength of Jupiter's orbit. In your time, perhaps, they didn't know how gigantic and powerful Majestic and devoid of life such a planet could be. It's truly unlike our own, though none of us have ever set foot there, and never will because... <laughs> I apologize, there I go again. I still have so much to learn from you. I promise I'll write again. Take care. Mike. And so with that, uh, thank you for watching the video. Go out and read Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Cubas. I have more to say on this book, and probably more letters to write to Bras Cubas. And thank you, Machado de Assis, uh, if you are alive beyond the grave, for this wonderful, wonderful reading experience. And thank you for watching this video and following the channel. We'll see you next time.